so let me turn off my phone so you don't get that on there. Um, so thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, this is Reverend Clark Olson, who has agreed to share his story with us um, about the Selma uh, 1965 voting rights protests and voting rights march and his experience there. Um, as I mentioned, these are our interns, facilitators, program managers, actors who tell the story of, as we call it, the nation we build together, the um, ac actions of ordinary Americans that help cons consistently build this country, like yourself. And um, so it's just wonderful for all of us to get a firsthand, uh, firsthand uh, story from someone who put his life on the line to make the country a better place. So uh, our program in African American culture here at the museum for the past uh, 30 years has really focused uh, on both the stories of everyday people that made the civil rights movement happen and also the culture of the movement. And so my predecessor in that position, Bernice Johnson Regan, who founded the program, who studied the culture and particularly the music of the civil rights movement would always say, um, would always stress the importance of, of music in, uh, in the story. So I thought we'd just start as a good way to, um, to set some of the scene of Selma, start with a song uh, that was written immediately after the Selma to Montgomery march um, happened. It's called Murder on the Road in Alabama. It's written by Lynn Chandler. So. Rich is going to play that now. After we, uh, we were marching and marching, marching after the march was over, uh, my friend Cordell and I and a couple other guys got in our car to ride back the ro road that we had just marched down. Later, we were to learn that Viola Liuzzo had been shot on the road uh, to Alabama on Highway 80. And so I went to the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, and uh, I wrote this. on the road in Alabama Murder on the road in Alabama If you're fighting for what's right If you're black or if you're white You're a target in the night in Alabama in Alabama I know who is to blame in Alabama She caught two bullets in the brain before I learned to say her name And George Wallace is the shame of Alabama March right by that spot in Alabama. March right by that spot in Alabama. Yes, we march right by that spot where the coward fired the shot, where the Klansman fired the shot in Alabama. There's a man behind the guns of Alabama. Man behind the guns of Alabama. There's a man behind the guns. He kills for hate, for fear, for fun. And George Wallace is top gun of Alabama. the sovereign state of Alabama. Deep within the sovereign state of Alabama. Deep within the sovereign state, there's a poison pit of hate. And George Wallace is the heart of Alabama. 
Jackson on the road to Alabama. Reeve on the road, Reeve on the road to Alabama. William Moore's been dead and gone, and still the killing goes on. Now it's Liuzzo on the road to Alabama, in Alabama. There's a movement on the road in Alabama. There's a movement on the road in Alabama. Black man, white man, Christian Jew, we're gonna keep on marching through until the tyrant's day is due in Alabama. Oh, it's murder on the road in Alabama. It's murder on the road in Alabama. If you're fighting for what's right, if you're black or if you're white, you're a target in the night in Alabama. So, had you heard that before? I've not. I've never heard. Not heard that before. I've. Been, I'm acquainted with Viola Luzo's mm -hmm. daughters and mm -hmm. family, um, but us was the first time I've heard yeah. that. I heard Lynn Chandler uh, perform that at the 50th anniversary of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and there's uh, down in, in Raleigh, uh, Shaw University in Raleigh, um, uh, where SNCC started, and uh, yeah, there's so many uh, of those kind of songs that we don't remember of, of the movement and, and I for me it's always um, it uh, adds something to my understanding of it thinking of you know all these young people and and you know just all these people generally kind of getting together and these songwriters you know finding a way to express what yeah. just happened to them and so what had just happened uh, so that happened right after the the triumph of the of the Selma to Montgomery March the March finally takes place and goes from Selma to to Montgomery Martin Luther King gives a sp famous speech there uh, but then they all have to get back from this 54 mile journey from uh, Montgomery back to Selma. Um, and so there's, you know, throughout the movement uh, for any of these kind of big events like that, there is just a logistical challenge. Um, uh, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about the attack on you. Um, and, but even with that, I was talking with Diane Nash, um, who was one of the organizers in Selma then, and was talking about even with, with that, the difficulty of finding an ambulance and like, you know, having ambulances in the first place, planning for, for what if something happened. But they also had to, you know, find carpools and so forth and get back from uh, from Selma to, or from Montgomery to Selma. And Viola Liuzzo, who was a white woman from Detroit who had come down and answered the call like you did and came down and was just helping shuttle uh, marchers back that, uh, during that journey. Uh, so she was shot. Um, as she drove and was killed, you know, the, the night of the, the triumph of, of, the, of the march um, after it's been completed. And she was the third person who was killed during that whole, during the Selma campaign. We heard in the song, uh, Jackson on the Road of Alabama, that was Jimmy Lee Jackson who was killed. He's uh, portrayed in the Selma film. And then Jim Reeb, and we'll talk a lot about, um, was also killed in, in the midst of it. And that was, uh, the, 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 those murders were a big rallying cry for not just the wor workers in Selma, but the whole country. Uh, so we'll get to that. Um, we here um, want to start our story of the, of this part of the movement with the Greensboro sit-ins in 1960. So I wanted to, before we get to Selma, just talk a little bit about your, you know, those previous five years for you before you get to Selma. What, what how are you um, intersecting with the movement and what, what is kind of going on in your life in those periods? Um, in 1959, I graduated from Harvard Divinity School. And uh, I had tried two years prior I had served part-time as a minister 
in the Westboro, Massachusetts Unitarian Congregation, which was founded in, along with the founding of the town back in 1720 or something like that. So, um, uh, so I was part-time minister there. I graduated from Harvard in 59. Then I became full-time in Westboro. Then I moved uh, to Berkeley, California in 62. In Westboro, I was active in a number of things in the community, but it essentially it was an all-white community. Um, it's a long time committee, a small town, and I did some usual social, kind, social action kinds of things, but nothing particularly uh, outstanding at all. Uh, during that time, I was trying to get a congregation financially um, more viable than it was when I arrived. And um, then I decided to go to Berkeley. And that was in 62. Now, Berkeley was a pretty active place uh, socially in 62, uh, in the, all the 60s. The free speech movement was happening. Some of you have heard of that, perhaps. Um, Mario Savio was a leader of the student protest. The Vietnam War was also going on. So there were uh, a lot of activities about that, protests about that. And I spent a, not a lot of time, but a fair amount of time uh, counseling people who were wanting to apply for conscientious object objector status <coughs> to, be to be recognized by the draft board as a CO. Uh, you had to have a religious basis for your conscientious objection. It couldn't just be political or philosophical, a religious one. So people who didn't have particularly, have any, particularly have any religious background would come to me as a Unitarian minister, and I would talk with them, and I would come up with some conclusion that there was or wasn't a, a some kind of religious stance behind their and, – and that resulted in my writing a letter to the draft board and I did quite a number of those things. I, but there were also school segregate, uh, school integration issues in Berkeley uh, that were ongoing. Berkeley was a pretty liberal community, but there still were some issues. And um, the, there was Planned Parenthood as well. Uh, and I was, um, uh, I was on the board of Planned Parenthood. So uh, social issues were around. And on the campus, they were on the free speech movement. There were members of my congregation who were kind of on both sides of the free speech movement. And our s congregation building was just a couple blocks from campus. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I happened to know Joan Baez from years before I had dated, when I was at Harvard, I had dated the roommate of Pauline Baez. So, uh, uh, Paul, Pauline Baez asked me to uh, officiate at her wedding in Mass back in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And Joan had been there at the wedding and she was a bridesmaid and she'd sung at the wedding and now she was singing on the Berkeley campus. And, mm -hmm. and so I gave her, I decided I wanted to do a Sunday, Sunday service called The Times They Are A-Changing. Mm -hmm. And so I called her and asked her if she would come and sing on Sunday morning, which she did. Um, and that was great. And so uh, I, I was involved in social issues, but not focused specifically on interracial, mm -hmm. although that was a part of what I was involved with. Um, but then, so that was my background. And I, I can say that I previously in my family bringing up history, there was some involvement. My father was a Unitarian minister. Uh, while I was growing up mostly, most of my school years in Toledo, Ohio. Mm. And uh, I remember, and that was during the Second World War and following the Second World War. And I remember him giving a series of sermons uh, that were related to tolerance. One was if I were a Catholic, another was if I were a Jew, and another one if I were a Negro. So I can remember hearing those sermons and getting the congregation feedback from that as a kid. Mm -hmm. um, and then my mother had been involved with, with a, a multi-church, multi-faith effort to get the 
department stores of the town to hire blacks to be other than, to wait on the customers, mm -hmm. to be other than backstage, moving boxes around or something, to wait on customers. And department stores in Toledo were not hiring blacks to do that uh, in the mid-1940s. And my mother was a part of a church women's group, uh, multi-denominational, that got those petitions. And I can remember those petitions being stacked on our dining room table. And, and the result of it was that the department stores changed their policies. Mm -hmm. And from then on, they did hire blacks to wait on customers. So that was a part of my bringing up. Mm -hmm. um, um, so now I'm in Berkeley and in the 60s and uh, involved with the turmoil there. And uh, I took a trip to, Viet to uh, Washington to v on the clergy and others united against the war in Vietnam. Uh, there was such an organization, multi-denominational. And I remember flying to Washington and meeting with my congressman and finding that my congressman was, was dis dismally ignorant. I knew more about Vietnam than he did. And I realized that from that part of the congressman's job that unfortunately is to be uh, is to serve on subcommittees, and he didn't serve on some subcommittee related to foreign policy, mm -hmm. so he didn't he just he didn't know, he didn't know. And so my visiting him was a part of pay attention, buddy, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. pay attention. Vietnam's wrong, and that was a learning lesson for me about. Congress and how to yeah. how to move Congress or why they don't move on some things. And what year? What year? Would that, that would have been, been around 1967. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, we were that, that we, I guess it would have been about 67, mm -hmm. 60, 66 maybe. It was I think after Selma. Yeah. Yeah. So go, go ahead. Uh, had you um, before Selma? Had you traveled for any of? Any other marches or March on Washington or any of those? No, but I had done some traveling. Yeah. I had been uh, in 1954. This is out of the blue for you, I'm sure. In 1954, I was chosen by the Oberlin College students, student body to be one of us, to represent Oberlin College in a Russian-American student exchange. And it turned out there were only two Americans who went to Russia that summer, and no, no, no Russians came here. But I, as a junior in college, found myself lying in bed in a hotel, looking out at the red stars on top of the Kremlin Towers, saying to myself, how the hell did I get here? <laughs> but I took a lot of pictures, 200 pictures. And uh, I was there for two weeks. Uh, now, now St. Petersburg, Leningrad, Moscow, Minsk, and then back through Warsaw and Prague and Budapest. My friend was with my colleague, friend was from CCNY, and he had been from Budapest. So we visited some of his relatives there. But I, as a result of that trip, I and the pictures that I took, I paid my way through college the next year uh, by giving talks on the rubber chicken circuit. Uh, the Kiwanis clubs and Rotary clubs, but also high school assemblies and so on. So I had a shtick, as it were, uh, on giving talks on Russia. And five years later, I was still giving talks on Russia when I graduated from, from Harvard. So uh, I was going back to Harvard, to back to Russia in 1959 um, when I finished it at, uh, at Divinity School to get more pictures. Um, and then I went back I, in 59, I met a Russian gal and we got married in 1960 in Moscow. So I was breaking barriers. Uh, her, our marriage and her trip to this country six, six months later, during the middle of the YouTube spy plane episode, that made headlines across the country. The ambassador announced our marriage <laughs> Uh, in the middle of the U-2 plane stuff with the Paris Peace Conference having been um, uh, canceled and Eisenhower's trip to Ro Moscow having been canceled. The spirit of David, had, Khrushchev had met Eisenhower at, in Camp David and, and in the September of uh, 50, 59, I guess that was. Um, anyway, 
and then it was all blown up, and, and wh what the hell is going to happen now between our two countries? And in the middle of that, the ambassador announced this American minister had married this Russian gal, and she was on her way to this country. And uh, so I've had my Andy Warhol 15 minutes of fame <laughs> twice in my life. Now. Yeah. Well, let's talk. Uh, let's get get to that second one. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, so Selma. So, you know, we again started our our look at the civil rights movement in this um, uh, 1960 period with the um, formation of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and um, Moved through uh, through the sit-ins and the freedom rides and so forth, and by 1964, uh, the Civil Rights Act is passed and segregation is is struck down. But um, something happened uh, a bit m earlier than that to really focus a number of people in the movement on on voting rights. Now, uh, one of the things I think uh, is interesting about the Selma. Uh, Ava DuVernay's Selma, Selma film is, you know, it's really a bio of, of King shown through the Selma story, but uh, the one of the things that I think is missing in that in that film is that the uh, the struggle for voting rights in um, in Dallas County and, and where Selma is was a, an ongoing long term process by the people that lived. There, um, the people, so people like Amelia Boynton Robinson, and and some of those folks who were there were already working on voting rights for a long time. And Selma was like some places across the South, but it was unique in the sense that um, you know uh, I think this happened quite a bit in Mississippi, but in in most places of the South, you didn't have quite the Complete exclusion of, of blacks from the from the voting rolls, and so in in Selma there were just it was just you know there was it was a very high black um, population and just nobody was registered to vote. And they were trying for years to push uh, for it um, locally, but there hadn't been most of these national civil rights organizations hadn't really turned their attention on that. And one of the things that really turned the SCLC Martin Luther King's organization to it was uh, so right after the um, right and this is I think the Selma movie rightly begins with this right after the March on Washington in the same way as you had the great speech in Selma and then the Viola Liotto murder um, in after the March on Washington um, you know right after that you get the Birmingham uh, bombing uh, church bombing and um, that really motivates particularly Diane Nash and, and Jim Bevel to say okay you know, we need to do something about this. Um, we can't let this stand. We can't let you know these children be killed and not do something. And so they thought about the choices that they had, um, including, you know, getting just uh, abandoning nonviolence and you know finding out who did it and getting them killed, which they said she, Diane Nash told me she thought of you know very um, strategically and thought they could possibly do that. But then they said no. You know, let's try for something that King wasn't interested in doing just shut down the whole state. Like if we do a massive, do something like they've done with Freedom Summer and so forth, get a call out to the entire country, come down there and do, those of you familiar with the Bayard Rustin uh, program we did where he says, you know, put your body in, in places where wheels don't turn. They said, let's do that to Alabama. Let's do, let's put activists in every part of the state that matters and shut down everything in the state so the state can't do business at all until voting rights are changed uh, because voting rights are just so key. Johnson says, you know, you just we just had a civil rights act in 1964. We can't do a, there's, it's not in the cards to do a voting rights act. It's just, you can't have back-to-back -back civil rights acts. I, you know, had to do all these things in Congress to make this, to make the first one happen. We're not gonna get the second one. Slowly they convinced King to be involved. But again, this that's all to say, there were already people there um, working locally, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee had moved in to do some more active organization and registering people to vote. And then finally, the King organization gets down there and starts doing um, things that, and there's, there's the beginning of, uh, you know, just disagreements with uh, tactics. And so the, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, kids don't think that marches, think marches are silly, for instance, but King wants to do these demonstrations. So there's all these different groups down there, finally, but a lot of people now are focused on Selma. Um, and 
um, and uh, most of you probably know about the about the bloody Sunday, the beginning of the march that when uh, the, that first march when John Lewis is beaten and and all of and all of that happens. But um, so that so we can maybe we should talk a little bit about the beginning of of you know how much you were knowing about and interested in Selma. Uh, kind of up to Bloody Sunday, um, and then we'll get to what happened after that. Up to Bloody Sunday, I really was not, I was not aware of all of, of all that you talk about. I say not aware. I'm sure there were occasional stories in the paper that uh, I wasn't totally ignorant, but uh, it really wasn't on my uh, screen, as it were. Um, I do know, as have learned since, I understand that King and President Johnson had had in a conversation where Johnson said, I, I can't do it politically, I can't do it. And th they identified, as I understand it, identified that somewhere there needed to be um, a, an action. And there had to be local, strong local leadership for it, as there was, as you've described in Selma. And there had to be a, a villain in it, as there had been with the uh, Bull, Bull, Bull Connor in, in um, uh, Birmingham, um, and there had to be um, there had to be some tra tragedy, uh, and I, I gather that they the three of them had shared that thought mm -hmm. in order to move public opinion. Um, not that they were planning for it, but that the, but with uh, with Sheriff Clark in in Selma and the surrounding county, and with the strong Selma uh, people, uh, African-American community that was strongly engaged in the voting rights thing, and a city of some significance. Selma was of some significance in the, in the old cotton belt in the south. It was a port from which cotton was shipped out uh, down the river. Um, so um, there were the elements. I learned that later. I didn't, as I say. Right, and that's one of the sort of you know um, one of the odd things about nonviolence is, and King talked about this, and and uh, and Rustin and and Julian Bond and so forth. That, that's sort of this odd dichotomy because, in the one hand, you're being nonviolent. You're not going to hit, you know, when you're hit, yeah. right? You're not going to hit back. But in some cases, politically, you sort of need violence because you know if if and and this is where it hadn't worked. Um, in uh, in in certain areas like Albany, Georgia, and so forth, where where you know one of the sometimes the opponents, um, you know, if you have a in Selma Sheriff Jim Clark, if you have a Bull Connor in Birmingham, who are the ch police chief that's just going to kind of strike back and you know cause these things. Th there were uh, there were opponents of the movement who realized. Well, you know, if we don't do anything, you know, if we if we don't if we um, make sure uh, that there are enough jails and we can, you know, we they can't, you know, the the, the, the tactics that they're using to fill the jails aren't going to work because we we've, we've got more jails, we've got enough jails to put <laughs> anybody in in jail, and if there and if we don't use fire hoses and dogs and beat them and put it on TV, you know, some of their tactics fall away. Selma wasn't like that because you had Jim Clark who right. hadn't apparently thought that through, <laughs> um, and uh, or was somewhat of a psychopath anyway. Yeah. But um, but uh, so so you you know you do get a lot of, of violence um, that happens, and you have Bloody Sunday. So you like the rest of the country see hear about it and think, how can these That's exactly? Uh, these I saw it on television. Marches. I saw it on television Sunday evening. I was shocked. Absolutely shocked. How could that happen in this country? That was basic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when you look at the footing, it's still shocking footage. So I shared that shock with my family and my four-year-old daughter, um, but not a whole lot, because um, they, they weren't in a position to understand that much. Um, 
And the next morning, I had no thought of going to Selma. I heard on the radio at noontime that uh, Martin Luther King was asking the clergy across the country to go to Selma on Tuesday, to arrive in Selma on Tuesday to march again. I heard that on the radio, and my thought, first thought was, I'd really like to go. From what I just told you about all the Russian stuff, you can see that there's some kind of adventure in my, in my psyche, in my genes, like a DNA. But I quickly dismissed the idea of going because I said, I don't have the money. And I've got a, I had further excuse that I had a couple of church committee meetings that I had scheduled and I was supposed to be at. But then I got home, and there was a message from a couple, a very nice couple in the congregation, who said they would pay my way to go to Selma if I wanted it. I suddenly had to rethink all those excuses. Now I had the money, and uh, I could tell the con I could tell those committee chair that I wouldn't be there for the meetings. And uh, I'd said to uh, my wife, I'd, I'd like to go. And um, so I, I, and I assured her and myself that there are going to be hundreds of clergy there, and Sheriff Clark's deputies are not going to attack. I mean, that would be just a di public relations disaster if that ever happened, if they got around to attacking cler clergy the way they were attacking the the marchers on this, the Edmund Pettus Bridge. So I felt that I was going to be okay. And um, I wasn't sure when I was going to be back. Uh, I didn't know that, that much about it, but I I got on the plane Tuesday morning to go to Selma. Got on a plane that had to go to New Orleans first, and then there was engine problems there. So we were delayed getting to Montgomery. Uh, I didn't get to Montgomery until mid-afternoon. And um, in the Montgomery airport, there was a uh, young African-American man who was uh, uh, volunteering to shuttle people back and forth between the, the airport and Selma, much like the old Luzo's uh, situation, um, except that was for the march in, to Montgomery. Um, anyway, I said, yeah, I'll take, I'll, thank you, I'll take the ride. So we got in the car. It was all new to me, never been in the South before. And I saw these billboards. I saw the poverty. That was striking. The poverty of the housing in, along the road, 55 miles or so between the Montgomery Airport and Selma. I saw the poverty, and I also saw two or three, probably two, big billboards from the Ku Klux Klan or the White Citizens Council saying, Martin Luther King is a communist. And I knew that it had been... King had been accused of that, but to see that in a billboard and to know that people are living there and seeing that every day and having that message drummed into them just struck me as being unusual. Um, the whole um, dastardly. Anyway, I got to Selma, and the marchers had already gone, the clergy, and, and there was clergy from all denominations that were there. Um, Jewish nuns, priests, rabbis, um, Protestant, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, who knows what else, I don't know. Um, but they were there, and uh, when I arrived, they had already been out to the other end of the bridge. And it was labeled Turnaround Tuesday. Have you heard that uh, label? Because... Martin Luther King had gotten word that the federal judge had banned the march. It said, you can't go uh, to Montgomery. And, but there were all these clergy coming to town, and what do we do? So they negotiated, they meaning King and the, the, the attorney general, or whoever else was involved, um, and the judge. They negotiated that the marchers would go across from the Brown AME Chapel, they would go across the bridge, two, two by two. Um, and I understand that march was something like a mile long. Um, 
But anyway, they'd go to the other end of the bridge, and uh, there would be the state troopers saying, no, you can go no further. And the agreement was that they, the leaders, King and others, would kneel and pray and um, lead the others in doing the same, and then turn around and go back. Many of the clergy did not know that that was in the works. They were, some of them were angry uh, that they were doing that, that they were going back. But by the time I arrived, they had all come back, or most presumably, uh, had come back to the Brown Church and they were standing in front of it and Martha, Martin Luther King was addressing the crowd. And um, apparently he, I, I, I learned later, that he would be negotiating overnight and figuring out what they were going to do the next day with all these people. Were they going to march or not? Um, so he was in the middle. He couldn't say anything to the whole group at that time because he was in the middle of such negotiations. So he, all he said was, as many of you can, some of them had just come down for the day, assumed they were just coming to Selma for the day and then going back to Boston or New York or wherever they came from. So. Some of them did not go to stay around. But he, he urged everyone who could to please stay for another day or two, stay overnight, go, eat, go off and eat dinner, and be back here at Brown Chapel at 7.30. So this is, I'm, I'm arriving just about the time he's saying that to everybody. So I didn't know much of anything. I was puzzled, confused. I knew mm -hmm. I just didn't know, have enough information. Mm -hmm. But I looked around. And I saw among quite a few Unitarian minister colleagues of mine, whom I'd met on other occasions, I saw Orloff Miller and Jim Reed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the three of us just arbitrarily out of the blue just said, let's, let's go to dinner together. Mm -hmm. but those two had arrived earlier in the day, so they had more information. They'd been oriented to what the situation was, where such and so, where the Boynton insurance mm -hmm offices, they were leaders, the local leaders of the march, um, and, and where to eat and so on. So we went off to Walker's Cafe. Let, let me just back you up for Go one ahead. second there. So when you get, so, you know, I, I um, it's not often you get to, you know, meet someone who, you know, was a few feet away from Martin Luther King speaking. So, uh, you know, when you got do down there, had you, I mean, assume you'd seen him speak on TV. Was that the first time in person? That no, it was not the first time, though I, I did not get close to yeah. him at that time, <coughs> nor had I been close to him before. But he had been a major speaker at one of our Unitarian Universalist Association annual meetings. I think it was one that was held in Boston. He had graduated from BU, from Boston University Theological School, and some of my friends, ministerial friends, knew him okay. in theological school, but I had not been close. I'd heard him speak on that 10 years before, let's say. Okay. I'm not sure of the exact age. Right. And mm. could you sense the anything in kind of the mood of the, because as you, as you mentioned, uh, the many of the people who'd come into town were there to do this march, and then all without them knowing it was going to happen, the march gets out to the bridge, and then they and turns around and goes back where it came from, and they're thinking, well, what did we come down here for, and so forth. From the king and Andrew Young and so forth point of view, the marchers, King had not violated to this point, it had not viola violated a federal injunction, uh, but a federal judge, he had violated state, you know, laws and and so forth. Although sometimes you would have to be careful about you know whether they you know violate a. a uh, ruling of a judge, even even from the state level, but he hadn't done that from the federal level, and thought, you know, was trying to curry favor with the president. Um, it's not a good idea politically to violate this federal judge uh, order. Plus, if they did, then if they did, then you know, the police that are there could beat them all up with with federal authority, you know, because they're, viol you know, so they thought, you know, there's nothing else to do except turn around, but they didn't tell the crowd that, for one, um, and two, all the student, all the young workers, all the student nonviolent coordinating committee people don't think marches are a good idea anyway, and they certainly don't think an arch, you know, march, don't, they don't, you know, they don't, they're more firebrandish, and they're like thinking, well, just violate the law anyway, and what we all come here for, so was that, was that kind of helpable you, to you? Uh, I wouldn't say it was it was palpable, but I I was aware of yeah. some of that. Okay. I was also uh, later aware that John Lewis 
uh, despite the opposition of the SNCC mm -hmm. group, he being co coordin co chairman of SNCC, nevertheless chose to march right. and, uh, and to lead the march across right. uh, the on Bloody Sunday. Right. Um, he and Ralph Abernathy, I think it was, was it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, actually, it was um, it, uh, Abernathy wasn't there yet. It was um, okay. uh, uh, Juanita Williams, Hosea Williams. Oh, so um, Hosea we Williams. have his his coat upstairs. Oh, well, yeah. and, and and his wife uh, Juanita Williams's um, shoes um, up and on display so upstairs as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if those were the ones you wore, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, uh, so, uh, but also, you know, there'd been this beating and and tear gassing yes. and so forth was I mean were there people still there that you n knew kind of injured from that either physically or psychologically I mean what was the mood after that uh, I the mood was mostly I could could catch the mood mostly in the restaurant mm -hmm. Walker's Cafe which was normally black but this was integrated okay. because of all the Outside agitators. Okay, so let's uh, let maybe go go to that. So you meet two people that you didn't know were going to be there, but they're your friends. Right. Yep. Um, I was not really friendly with, close to Jim Reeb. Uh -huh. I was more That's friendly right. with Orloff Miller, um, just by happenstance. But um, but the three of us went together, and I'd met Jim before. I knew who he was. Um, so we got into the restaurant, and it was just full of full of the marchers. There were African Americans as well as whites there, and uh, lots of lots of them clergy, you assumed. Um, and we had dinner, and uh, there were some come people coming up to our table and saying hello and, and questioning whether Jim was going to go back to Boston that, that night or not. And, and I didn't know what I was quite going to do. Um, but uh, I s we sensed, I think it was a more of a positive energy. That's what I felt that mean in that restaurant was a positive energy. We were there for some, I didn't hear any grousing right. about, oh, geez, they didn't go. Uh, I just didn't hear that. Um, the king had made this decision, and everybody, I think, was respecting it that that point after they'd done whatever they needed to do by way of grousing about it. Um, Anyway, there was this very positive energy, and uh, it was a very pleasant circumstance. Um, and so we, we 7.30 was coming up as the deadline to get back. So, so I said to Orloff and Jim, let's, let's leave. There was one pay phone there in the restaurant, and uh, both Orloff and Jim made a, pay, made a phone call to their spouses uh, saying that they were going to stay overnight. Um, that was the first time that uh, Jim's wife had been very much opposed to his going down. They had four children, and uh, she was anxious, very anxious about that. Um, he had previously been an associate minister uh, in the All Souls Unitarian Church here in Washington on 16th Street and whatever. Some of you know that. It's a wonderful congregation, and I was asked to speak there on the 50th anniversary of his death. Mm. Uh, and that was a wonderful occasion for me. Um, uh, anyway, we, we decided to leave. They made the phone calls. And we, were, we had come to the restaurant from around this way, from the Brown Church, uh, Brown Chapel. We had come around this way. Was, we had passed by, or close by, Boynton Insurance Office, and then come to the restaurant. And then as we left the restaurant, we went out the door and went that way, closer. It was a shorter, shorter distance back to the Brown Chapel. And it was a, we were about halfway down the block uh, when three or four men came at us, white men, came at us from across the street. One of them was wheeling a club. Don't know whether it was a baseball bat or a pipe or what, but it was substantial. And uh, they came at us, yelling at us. And if, if I may use the word, the N-word, uh, they, ye they were yelling, hey, you niggers, at us. And uh, I, I, I was just, I was really afraid. Mm -hmm. I was afraid. Um, they, ca they kept, we whispered to each other, keep, keep walking. Mm -hmm. 
keep walking. And uh, um, again, I hadn't gotten the orientation. They had. Orloff knew about the <coughs> prayer for protecting position, putting your hands above your head and going to the <laughs> sidewalk, putting your head on the sidewalk. Um, they came up behind us, and I looked behind just as they just as the guy swung the club. So I saw this club swing. I was walking on the I was walking on the building side of the sidewalk, all off in the middle, and Jim on the curb side. So the fellow who came up behind us probably, I'm guessing, was probably left handed, uh, since he swung the club at Jim's head. Um, at any rate, Jim happened to be there, and I happened to be on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, such is life, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so Jim fell to the ground immediately. Orloff fell to the ground in the prayer for protection position, and he mm -hmm. was kicked and slugged. Uh, Jim was not attacked, to my knowledge, beyond the one blow to his head. Contrary to the to this depiction in the movie Selma, where he's hit quite a few times on the sidewalk. That did, did not happen, I'm quite sure. I ran to the corner, and a fellow ran after me and slugged me in the head a few times, knocked my glasses off, but I was essentially, and then went away. And so did the other guys who attacked us. They went away. I, I went back to Orloff and Jim and and uh, and Orloff, it seemed, was able to get up okay, though he'd been kicked and hit on the head some, but not with the club. Um, and Jim was lying there babbling, incoherent. Mm -hmm. Couldn't make out what he was saying. Uh, clearly, he was in great pain. Um, I, we went over, Jim and Orloff and I went to him, and we decided... We needed to get around to get him to the Boynton insurance office. That that was the nearest help that we could get. I can't tell you why we didn't go back in the restaurant. That was nearer, but we figured going going to the office where there were officials <laughs> there who could help us. Um, Jim was able to get. We were able to get him to his feet, and he put his arms over our shoulders, and we walked him around the block to the Boynton Insurance Agency. He was in great pain. He lay down on a, so on a uh, cot of some kind there and was moaning and groaning and so on. And we managed to get an ambulance. There was, there was, I believe, a funeral home right next door. So we had an ambulance readily available, a uh, hearse ambulance, to take us to the Dinkin, sorry, to the, uh, the, the infirmary in town, the black infirmary in town. Uh, Dr. Dinkins examined him and uh, and f determined uh, as the swelling was going on, in, he, he learned later, uh, the swelling was going on in his, the, his head from the, ble the, ble the bleeding inside of his skull was, was hurting, was hurting him. I was holding his hand while, while he was in great pain and he held my hand tighter and tighter squeeze tighter and then and then it went went limp as he went unconscious so i was the last person to be in touch with him all there oh the dr dinkin called to birmingham hospital and said uh, uh, we have we have this case we need to he knew, he, he made the judgment. There were no medical facilities in town that could handle this kind of an injury. So uh, w the idea was to put Jim back in the ambulance and drive to Birmingham. And, uh, and Dr. Dinkins had made the arrangement that would be okay. We had to stop to get a uh, $150 check or something from the Boynton Insurance Office. And then we also called over to the church to the Brown Chapel, and uh, managed to get hold of Dr. Homer Jack, a Unitarian minister who was head of the Department of Social Responsibility for the UUA, the Unitarian Universal Association. 
And uh, we told uh, Homer Jack what had happened. And there's a movie, a biography of King that came out years ago now in the 70s. Um, and it shows him, King, giving the speech to the, chap to the, to the, to the clergy that evening. And someone passes a note to him. And he reads from the note. He says, I've just been informed that three Unitarian clergymen have been hit on the streets, and one of them possibly suffered a brain concussion, and they're on their way to Birmingham to the University Hospital. So, so far as I know, that was the way the news got out. I'm sure there were FBI people there, and the local police, I guess, was inform were informed as well, though I d wasn't involved in that. So we got back in the ambulance. Uh, King announced it. Uh, we get in the ambulance to drive to, to Birmingham, about 80 miles, 90 miles. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten, 75 mm -hmm. miles. Anyway, longer distance than Montgomery. Um, and we got about, about a mile out of town when we suddenly had a flat tire. And uh, we looked behind, and there was, a, there was a, an old Nash, old at that time, it was a new model, Nash Metropolitan, which was a small car but it was full of white men. And they pulled up on the road behind us. We had this flat tire. What's going to happen? Uh, we didn't know. Uh, we said, well, we better, we can't, we can't get out and change the tire here on the road. We don't know what those guys are going to do to us. So we better turn the ambulance around and drive back in on the rim of the wheel. Oh, before we did that, we said, well, let's make a phone call. There was a radio telephone in the, glove compartment of the car of the ambulance, but it didn't work. And that led to, is this all a conspiracy? The flat tire, the radio phone didn't work, the guys behind us, it was, it was frightening. We turned the car around and uh, drove back to the edge of town. There was a radio station, the driver, our driver, had worked in that radio station, so he felt that he could make a, a telephone call from there, and uh, we did. Uh, but the car full of whites behind us also turned around and parked right beside us in that parking lot, and they got out and walked around and knocked on the ambulance and made unfriendly gestures, said, said things. I don't remember any particular thing, but uh, it, it was not friendly, and we were scared what was going to happen. And then, over, then finally, it seemed like after two hours, but I'm Sure, it was more like a half an hour at the most. Finally, the second ambulance came. And uh, then Orloff and I suddenly realized we're sitting in the back holding the ambulance, holding the gurney, because the, bra the brackets in the ambulance had broken. So he and I had to hold the gurney so Jim didn't fly back and forth across the, across the, uh, the ambulance. Um, anyway, we suddenly realized, golly, we're going to have to get out shift Jim over, who was still unconscious, shift him over to the other ambulance. And with these guys around, what are they going to do? That was a little bit scary, too. And then I got out of the ambulance, and one of the guys, those fellows going around the car, came up to me and said, hey, what happened here? And all I could bring myself to do was say, please don't. Please don't. That's all I said. And they didn't do anything. They did not do anything. We managed to get Jim's body into the new, uh, the newer hearse uh, uh, ambulance, and the state trooper came by, asked, uh, "Could he help something? Could he do something?" We asked for an escort to Birmingham. He said, "I'll get, I'll lead you out to out of town to get you on the right highway to Birmingham, but you won't need me after that. Uh, you'll be okay." And the police had, I mean, the state troopers had attacked at the Independence Bridge. Was he really going to help us? You know, it was, we decided to go with him, go with, follow his, follow his lead. Uh, but you didn't know what he was leading you to. Um, so we did get out on the road. And by the time we got to Birmingham, to the University Hospital, of course, the doctor, the hospital was all ready for him. And the press and the FBI were there, already there, um, apparently from Martin Luther King having announced it. Um, so we arrived at about 11 o'clock at night. 
it was just, it was that long from the 7:30 deadline time to 11 o'clock at night, and Jim was still unconscious, and uh, Orloff and I were up until about 1 o'clock in the morning talking with the reporters, but also with the FBI, who were very much interested in what we were saying, getting all the details of it that we could give them, give them. And the hospital offered us hospitality, Orloff and me, to stay overnight in the hospital if we wanted. Jim, of course, had been wheeled immediately into emergency care and intensive care and so on. Um, and w the hospital offered us hospitality, but a, a couple from the, uh, a married couple from the Unitarian Church in Birmingham arrived on the scene in the hospital and offered us hospitality in their home. And uh, we decided to go with them. Um, and it turned out to be a, a rather nice decision because they were very active in civil rights affairs in Birmingham. And they had, a 20, they had already hired a 24-hour armed guard for their house because of their activities. So we went to a house that was... that was guarded. The next morning we came back to the, the, to the hospital and there were yellow roses from President and Mrs. Johnson. And soon uh, Jim Reeves' father arrived from Wyoming and Jim Reeves' wife, Marie, arrived from Boston. Uh, President Johnson had been in touch with them and it turned out John Johnson also, after Jim died, President Johnson ordered presidential planes, whatever they were, to bring Jim's father back to Wyoming and bring Marie back to, Bo to Boston, where they lived. Um, so Johnson was following this right away. The next morning, we again had interviews. We were on Orloff, uh, not Orloff. Orloff and I were on C Walter Cronkite CBS and Huntley and Brinkley's ABC, and NBC, and I was on ABC. I was on ABC News, and we were interviewed by a local television station and radio stations as well. And um, uh, I have a nephew, nephew who worked at ABC News uh, a few years ago, and he found in the archives uh, the interview with me back in 1965. Um, so we were back the next day, and uh, lots of interviews again. That. On Thursday, the, 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 it happened to us, I'm sorry, on Wednesday, on Tuesday night. On Wednesday, with the news out across the country of this uh, attack on a clergy, and he's unconscious in the hospital. There were thousands of people who gathered in Washington, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, et Boston, etc. Thousands of people who gathered. Big headlines. And uh, uh, that was wild. That was... That was to pray for Jim, who was still unconscious, that he might live. Then he died around midnight uh, Wednesday night. So Thursday morning, the crowds were there again out on the streets. Now in mourning, mourning his death. So two days of these big crowds across the country. And Johnson knew that he had something, that he had political support suddenly. The death of this white minister let it be clear. Got the attention of the country. In reference to Jimmy Lee Jackson, who had died a month or rough, roughly three weeks before, there was virtually no mention in the, pre in the, in the press about that. Johnson had not one phone call in reference to Jimmy Lee, Jimmy Lee Jackson. The records show that in reference to what happened to us and Jim's death and so on, Johnson had over 50 telephone calls in the few days between the attack on us and Monday when Congress, when President Johnson addressed the nation and addressed Congress. In his address, in his address to Congress, he specifically referred to Jim Reeb. He said there are times, and I can't quote it exactly, 
but there are times in the history when fate and history meet in such a way um, in man's unending quest for justice or freedom. Um, there are places, there are times that stand out and uh, such was in Concord and Lexington and such was in Appomattox and such was in in Selma last week. And one, one good man, a man of God, was killed. And he goes on and he says, and we shall overcome. First time a president had said those, particularly a southern president, had used those words. John Lewis, uh, Monday, when Johnson had invited Martin Luther King to be in Congress when he gave that speech. But Martin Luther King was instead in, Bo in Selma giving the eulogy at James Reeves uh, um, uh, memorial service. And he and John Lewis were in Selma. And John Lewis has told me about seeing when Johnson said, we shall overcome, tears came to Martin Luther King. John, John Lewis has told me directly in person he saw these tears come to uh, Martin Luther King. So that was uh, just uh, five days or so after the attack. We, we were attacked on Tuesday night, so six days. Tuesday, Monday evening, Congress is, is addressed by the nation, by Johnson. And uh, by August, uh, the Voting Rights Bill was passed outlawing uh, bold taxes and literacy tests. And I'm sure that many of you know those literacy tests were farces um, done at the, uh, to the pleasure of the local registrar who had to pass the test. And oh, I'm sorry, you didn't count the jelly beans in this jar correctly or the number of bubbles in the bar of soap or recite the third article of the Constitution or, or list, what was it in, uh, in the movie Selma, or Oprah was asked uh, yeah. how many, who, name all the judges, right. just district yeah, judges. And, and you know, what, one of the things I think that's, that it was interesting to me about that scene and kind of the typical you know, way we think of those literacy tests is that they you know, give you this impossible to answer sort of question and then in the movie the guy you know, sort of stamps it denied and so forth. We have a collection here, um, another you know, person who became interested in the civil rights movement, um, Alan Ridback, he changed his name later to Moses Moon. We have his collection of recordings oh. here in our archive center. Um, he, he went to the March on Washington, was inspired by it, and he spent the next two years going around with a real the real tape player just recording all these things and a lot of them you know in the south and there's a lot in Selma but he also was in the north just talking to like kids on the street in Chicago and so forth so it's an amazing collection um, but he spent a lot of time in Selma and was talking to people who had tried to register to vote um, we mentioned the Boynton uh, insurance company so Amelia Boynton was one of the like 20 or 40 people like in the whole county registered to vote and they sort of had been registered for a long time so she was always fighting to get more people to go and try to register and the, but the insidious thing about it really is most of the interviews they have when they talk about you know what it was like to register to vote they ask them fairly normal questions there's this one woman who was a she was you know college educated and so forth and she she answered all of the questions and they were they were you know, just normal civics kind of questions, and she just answered them all. She felt like she knew all the answers, but what, but mostly she described it as not as sort of a, not a adversarial, you know, uh, situation with the registrar. The registrar, you know, said hi, you know, knew her, said hi, how you doing, whatever, gave her the thing to look at, to fill out. She filled it out, she handed it, they said, okay, thank you, she went home. And then later you get a thing that just says you didn't pass without saying why or anything like that. So what those records say, what a lot of people you know talk about, including like uh, Amelia Boynton and her son uh, Bruce Boynton is still alive and talks about it's it's really the power, the lack of power that's really 
moving in that situation because oftentimes, you know, we, we in a movie like that, it'll make this sort of caricature of a lot of the people. And of course, you have the people who are like the clan, you know, people who are beating people up on the street and so forth. But there's all these other people that are making segregation and oppression and, and white supremacy go that are just going about their normal thing. And they don't, they don't really have any reason, like the clerk re who's got the registrar, who's got the, all the power about whether you get registered or not, doesn't really have any reason to get mad at the person who's coming up and trying to register because they're not going to let a, them register anyway. And there's just nothing you can do. And so that's what a, you hear a lot about a lot of the Selma residents about the thing that is so, you know, disheartening to them is just you have no power. There's, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's nothing you can do except when they start, you know, really kind of putting, you know, putting their bodies on the line and other people coming down to help them and then the country, you know, kind of all of a sudden noticing what they've been fighting for. So how long then were you, and when did you go home? I, um, I went home, uh, I think, t uh, two days later, a day after Jim died. So you weren't there for the march. I, was, I did not stay for the march, mm -hmm. nor did I stay for the, for the uh, memorial service. Mm -hmm. And the reason, the excuse I gave myself, was that I realized that I might be the sole witness to who it was who swung the club. Uh, so far as I knew, I, nobody else had seen it. Mm -hmm. And I thought if I go back to town, maybe someone who knows that I was in that group that was attacked, mm -hmm. and maybe someone would identify and want to get rid of a person who could testify at a murder trial. Mm -hmm. On Thursday that week, yeah. um, it was announced in the paper, the Birmingham paper, which we were reading, that three men or four men were arrested in Selma. So the arrests came almost immediately afterwards, yeah. after Jim's death. And so we knew that there would be a trial, at least I assumed there would be a trial. So I chose not to go back for the possibility of endangering myself mm -hmm. and not being able to testify in the trial. Well, and the murder trial. you know, you mentioned Jim Reeb had four, you know, wife and four children. You have a, you know, you have one yeah, child. I, and have my wife. Wife. I mean, yeah. you know, that's that that was weighing part of, on you. That too. was part of it too, no sure. question about it. Yes. Uh, shall I tell you about the trial? Mm -hmm. um, a few months later, the Orloff and I were called to go back down to Selma to testify at a grand jury hearing. The two, the three, four men had been arrested, and. Um, and uh, so we, we were met at the airport in Montgomery by Sheriff Clark's deputies who were there to escort us to Selma. That really felt good. <laughs> um, it was scary. Um, and they put us in a motel or a hotel room where we, uh, there was a window in the back of the room that was uh, high up. Um, and it opened out onto an alleyway behind. But somehow you couldn't lock this window. And I thought, oh dear, Olaf and I, you know, what do we do? Well, we decided to just go with it. Um, but it was scary. We testified the next day before the grand jury and told them what had happened and so on. It's a, it, this is this is a state. This is murder. This is this not is the, this, this is not civil rights yeah. violations. It's not they a were federal. they were arrested first on Thursday morning, I think, or Wednesday or whatever. They were arrested first for violating Jim's civil rights, um, and then when he died, it became a murder charge. So they were up for murder. Um, so then, six, a few months later, in December, I believe. Uh, we went back for the murder trial. And I was, uh, we, we had to se separately go into the courtroom. We couldn't both be in, I was going to be a witness, he was to be a witness, and you don't get called in, you know, until you're to testify. So I was, I was out in the, um, in the county courthouse there. And um, I remember Jim, uh, President Johnson, had, sorry, President Kennedy, had been killed in uh, Sel in uh, Dallas, and the assassin um, Lee Harvey Oswald had been shot in the courthouse. And I'm sitting out there in the courthouse, 
waiting to go into the trial. And Orloff had been called in, I guess, at this point when I was particularly agitated. Um, and I thought, what's what's going to happen to me? You know, I decided to take a little walk down the down the corridor. There were a couple of open offices down the corner. Nobody, there wasn't any hustle and bustle, but I just walked and and um, there was an open door there, and a man, a white man, uh, rather younger than I am now, but he was elderly. Um, I, he he was there and he said, well, what are you doing here? And I thought, do I really answer that question truthfully? And I decided I'd follow through. Yes, I'm here to testify in the trial about the murder of James Reeve. And then he said, you know, that, that was a terrible thing that happened. He said, they violated ho Southern hospitality. And I'm a, I'm a northerner. So I was born in Boston, and I thought to myself, violated Southern hospitality. They murdered the guy, you know. And I thought, what a terrible, what a w terrible way to say it. But I later in later years, I moved to Asheville, Al Asheville, North Carolina, with my wife of 40 years, Anna, sitting over there. And uh, that's her hometown. And I realized from uh, the comments made the frequent comments made, you're going through a grocery line or something and somebody says something to you, you know, how are you, um, have a nice day, etc. I realized that his comment violating Southern hospitality was more meaningful perhaps than I felt it at the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll just let it go with that. Um, um, so I, I testified at the murder trial, but they were found innocent three men were, were up for murder. Uh, the defense, the primary defense is, uh, issue was the, the defense's uh, point was that J the activists, us, had deliberately killed uh, Jim Reeve in order to create a martyr. Um, and uh, despite the testimony of Orloff and me and uh, some others, a few others, um, the, they were found innocent totally innocent. And the three of them went on and lived for quite a while. Um, the one of them who died, I think, just about two years ago now, uh, Duck Hoggle, his name was, um, ha had a, a used car business. And um, he sold used cars to town. His used car lot was right next to the, the projects, uh, the, the African American housing projects in, in Selma. So but most of his customers were probably African Americans, um, and he'd wave at the buses, the, the tour buses, as they went by, with I'm sure people not knowing who, who he was. But um, he finally died. Um, so out of the three people who were attacked and the three people who attacked us, I'm the only survivor of them. So um, I, it was because of that that I called the Smithsonian yeah. and said, "Would you like me to?" <laughs> <laughs> well, tell well, a little bit of what I know. Yeah, and when we when we first spoke, I mean, you um, the way you described uh, that that you were the last, you know, uh, you said you were the last uh, of that group that came together that yes. night, and I yes. thought that was just an interesting way to think of. It's not the way I would think of that of myself as as a group, including we those. Had a party, Do you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, uh, did you f uh, find the ability to forgive them, or how did? You, uh, Talk a little bit about that. Somebody asked me. Uh, uh, somebody asked me that some years ago, for the first time maybe, and I said, you know, I don't think it's my place to forgive them. I think it's that's a question for the Reeb family. Um, that's not a question for me. Um, I will, f I will do a turn from that question and say that the whole experience has been a gift to me. I mean, there's the tragedy, obviously. And I've come to know the Reeb family through the years. We got together for the 40th anniversary. Uh, we had dinner together um, in, a, in, a, in a little restaurant that 
in a, in a spot that's at, at the foot, almost at the foot of the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Um, and we had dinner there, a catered dinner. No, first time was in the hotel that's right there. Um, and the second was at the 50th anniversary in this other place. Um, and th that was, it was a privilege to be there. And it's a gift to me in the sense that, I, you know, I, I, why did I go? I went out of some feeling of injustice that I, and I wanted to do something, say something, although I, my initial reaction was I don't have the money, <laughs> but the money, money came. And so I went. And, and God, you don't go there assuming that you're going to be a hero. You don't go there assuming you're going to change history. But as a matter of fact, what happened was that I was right there at, at a moment and with a person that changed. It was a turning point in American history. And... That's quite a gift. I get to speak about it fairly often to students. Um, I'll be speaking to about 100 students tomorrow, middle schoolers here in Washington, on a seven days so sojourn through civil rights sites. And uh, I tell them that the, that the major lesson for me is, is that whenever you see something wrong, whenever you see an injustice, speak up, do something, say something. Maybe nothing will happen. Maybe you'll get hurt. But in my case, I just chose to go. And then we, I was on that side of the sidewalk et cetera, et cetera, and it's, y you change history. And you never know. You just never know what your action, just saying to some kid who's been abused on a playground, for instance, saying some words of encouragement, may change their life, may change their life. And you, we all have those opportunities in our lives, if not every day, certainly every month or every week. Uh, so I had my opportunity and the place with it. You hear that so much from veterans of the movement. Diane Nash was here a number of years ago and said, you know, that she often thinks that now we think voting is the only thing, you know, that you this is what you need to do to participate. And says that that ten minutes you spend in the voting voting booth isn't enough. And think she thinks back to if you know those of you who did work like you did and desegregated lunch counters and worked for on voting rights and so forth, had waited for elected officials to make change mm. as, you know, as we're often taught that that's how it should work, you know, mm. that, that that's how democracy works, that that's what our representatives are there for. But she said if we'd waited to do that, you know, how long would we have waited? Yeah. And she thinks we might still be waiting for yeah. some of those things. Um, do you guys have comments or questions? Um, here, use a microphone so that we capture it. Hi. Um, first, I just feel um, in awe and, and just blessed to hear your account. So thank you for sharing. Um, but I noticed a common thread when you were in the courthouse and were asked what were you doing there. Um, and then to when you when you spoke about um, the the ambulance, you know, being being asked these questions, what are you doing? What are you doing? And you said you just kind of went with it. You told the truth. Um, do you feel that the story would have been different if you hadn't? I don't know. I really don't. I assume that if I'd said something hostile to that guy who was being hostile to me, and hey, what are you doing? If I'd said something hostile, that could have led to something else that would have been unpleasant, not just to me, but maybe to Jim Reeb, too, or whatever. So I. It, it just came out of me. I didn't, I didn't plan to say that. Well, not even necessarily hostility, but if, if, if there was 
oh, I'm just walking my dog. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know the uh, a kind of passive response as opposed yeah. to yeah. the truth that you were that you were there for a cause, for yeah. a purpose. I don't know. I don't know whether it would have been different. I'll, I'd like to make the assumption that the, it wouldn't have been different. Um, that, that is, uh, sorry, if, that if I told the truth, that was better than not telling the truth. That's what I mean to say. That, that's so honorable because I think it goes back to what you said about when you speak to younger audiences and you tell them, you know, you have a voice and if you see anything, speak on it. And just that really stood out to me, the fact that you said in those instances of pressure and when people came to you, even in a hostile way, you responded with the truth. I really, yeah. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I well, thank you for being here. Of course. Um, one thing that I'm wondering is because it is a very trying thing to have to testify against something that has has people in uproar for many different reasons. Even though it wasn't a civil rights case, it happened due to a civil rights issue. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, you said Reeves' uh, family was, fa he was faced with resistance when he said he wanted to go. Did your family have resistance as well when you said you were going back to the place that started this to testify? No, there wasn't resistance. Uh, and I'll, s I'll say it's my wife at that time, we were married for 14 years. Uh, married in 1960. And she'd been in this country only five years. And she didn't have the understanding of American history in the South and so on from her Russian background. Mm. Uh, so she just didn't have the understanding. And so she trusted me when I said, at least she I think she did. Too. I never got any feeling otherwise. Uh, she trusted me that I was that making it as, I wasn't making a stupid judgment a stupid call to go. So I think there wasn't the resistance. Marie Reeb, on the other hand, had seen her husband frequently in relatively difficult situations, both in Washington as well as in Boston area where they were working. He was working in Boston for the Quaker, a Quaker uh, uh, organization of some kind that had programs in the uh, African American communities of Roxbury and Dorchester and the Boston area. And I'm sure that he saw more conflict than she saw, the reflection of that in her family life. Um, so I understand her, her opposition to it. Olaf's wife, I don't know enough about that situation. Was there hesitation or fear on your part knowing that you were getting ready to testify and show your face in a very, uh, you know, testy waters? And if so, what is it that got you through? Just the need, it's like being in the ambulance. Uh, that, that night in the ambulance when we, had the, when we had the flat tire, we were sitting out there on the highway figuring what to do, and there was something in me saying, get the hell out of this ambulance and run as fast as you can, you know? Mm. But then the thought occurred to me, well, Schwermer, Cheney, and Goodman had been found in a ditch just to, about five months before that, and I thought, my body, if I try to run from this situation, my, my body's gonna be in a ditch, possibly, with the guys behind us. So it didn't occur to me to, I mean, after a quick judgment, <laughs> it occurred to me, I better just stay here and go through it. So there was this constant, you just keep going. You just do what you need to do. You drive in the ambulance, you hold Jim's hand, you go in the highway, uh, you just you just keep going. You help Jim to get to his feet and go around to the Boynton office and so on. You just keep going. You just do it. Just to keep you're just there. You're just there. That's what you do. That's you're there. So, and there isn't that much of an alternative. There's not that good of an alternative. You know. Well, thank you for just keep going. has been speaking a lot following the movie with eyes on the prize. Prior to that, nobody asked what happened during the civil rights movement. After eyes on the prize, a lot of things started happening and it happened increasingly. 
Jim Clark keeps speaking to these civil rights groups of seniors and middle schoolers. Over a thousand people were touched. Yeah. And seven thousand seniors and youth and alumni. I heard a lot of them. Um, listening to him at one point, I thought, you know, it's been a long time since this happened, and yet he still cries. He can't talk about Selma without crying. Why does he keep crying about Selma? Why does that bring such deep emotions out of him? And it occurred to me that Selma broke his heart. And when you have a broken heart, you have this ocean of tears on which you live. And any time you go back to tell the story of what broke your heart, you're going to cry. There is that pain that will stay with you the rest of your life. And what I say to all of the youth that we meet with is, I wish for you in life a broken heart. Because if you don't ever in your life experience a broken heart, then you never truly invested yourself in this life. Because if you love, you're going to lose that love eventually. That love will die. That person will die. You will experience loss. A lot of the kids that we speak with are from inner city situations in California. Many of them have had friends of theirs shot in gunfights. They have experienced heartbreak and they have experienced loss. But I believe that this loss makes you stronger. I believe that a broken heart is the price you pay to be alive. Uh, and any of that message that you can pass on when you are talking about and demonstrating the cost that people paid for civil rights years ago is knowing that sitting at that lunch counter, they were so very brave and they have gone through the rest of their life with a broken heart experience that will touch them. We are privileged on our sojourn trip to go with Minnie Jean Brown Tricky, who was one of the Little Rock Nine, and we'll see her this evening. And when I talk about the broken heart, it makes Minnie cry. But as a 15-year-old, she went to school every day at Little Rock High, where people were going to stick her with pins and push her and spit on her and say, awful things to her, and yet she would go home, do her homework, get dressed the next morning, put on her best dress, comb her hair, and go back to that again. I don't know how a 50-year-old has the courage to do that. So I wish for you a broken heart, something that's worth putting yourself on the line for. So it's 2017, um, and I I can I can honestly say that I probably walk around with a broken heart every day, um, because it's 2017 and we talk about these things and yet I still see them. So I'm trying to figure out where we are supposed to find ourselves now, and if you have any guidance, if you do anything actively now that you can share with us to use this and, and move forward and continue to move forward. I think um, the times foster a lot of complacency and, and our social media activism fosters a lot of com complacency. And so I'm wondering now where do I put this broken heart? Where can I, where can we find ourselves now? I don't have any big answers to that, but I can say that I, I believe in, in my case, um, it's necessary for me to continue to have some activities. I'm on our local and the NAACP uh, organization, I'm with that, 
And I'm also on, we have an annual Martin Luther King breakfast in Selma, in Asheville, North Carolina, which attracts a huge number of people, a thousand people to this, uh, to this occasion. And, uh, and uh, I've been asked to get the next speaker to it. Uh, um, so I, I try to work with that, and I, and I realize that I, and I also belong to local YWCA, which is in the middle of the African American community in Asheville. My wife and I go there, and I've made friends there, and I realize that in my life, I don't have enough contacts, daily contacts with people uh, who, are, who look different from me. And I've decided I want to do that more. Um, and I do the Selma talk, the Sojourn talks. Um, and I talk whenever I, when I'm invited, basically. And, um, I think, personally, I think the elections yesterday were a hopeful sign. I think that, you know, I think that the, it's my judgment that, that things are, are turning and uh, we need to be behind that turn and I'm hopeful about that. Um, I really do, th I, you know, there's a pendulum in history and um, the worst is, it may have, it may be yet to come, but it also swings back. So I would take some hope from that and continue to put my voice out there occasionally speaking. I'm writing my memoirs right now, which is, I've gotten up to a page 120 and I'm, I'm in 1965 right now. <laughs> so, I'm, 80, I'm 84 years old. Um, I was born in 33. When I was 16 years, when I was 12 years old, I had rheumatic fever, and I had a damaged heart valve, two uh, two damaged heart valves. When I was 16, I had it again. First time I was out of school for a whole year. I was in lying flat on my bed for six months. Did not stand up, did not sit up for six months. The next time I stood up, the first time I stood up, I was six inches taller than the last time. That was a weird experience. I challenge you, <laughs> challenge you to think that one through. But uh, then again, when I was in the high in college in high school, senior year, I had rheumatic fever again, so I had to be out of school for half a year. And I was told years later by my parents that doctors back then said I probably wouldn't live to be 21. So I'm 84 now, and uh, um, <laughs> so I'm feeling good. I really feel privileged to be a part of it. And, and it feels good to be able to see that. You know, I've been through those eras of, of the Reagan and, uh, you know, so many different political eras. I, I was delivering newspapers on the day of the D-Day invasion of Normandy. And I remember coming home and hearing the radio broadcast about the, the, the American troop, paratroopers and so on. I'm, I'm that old. Uh, <laughs> And you see a lot of history, and, and you know some of it's really, some of it's really lousy. But then the pendulum swings, and I think we're in that pendulum swing right now. Uh, I hope so, but we can all add our our energy to it and make sure it does swing. So that's not a good answer to your question, but thank you. Maybe one more question. Um, <clears throat> one, one quick one. I just was wondering, um, it's hypothetical. Um, would do you think that um, your choice would have been different if Dr. King didn't explicitly call out to clergymen? He just asked for any men and women who felt moved to come here. Because I, given a lot of the things that you said, I can't seem to think how you weren't destined to be there, the way things, in hearing it, um, the way things were falling into place. But I also can't imagine people like yourself doing or experiencing some of the things that you've done without being people of faith. Like getting back to, I think, where it's about like choosing when to just tell the truth. Yeah. Like I have, I've 
been privileged and blessed enough to not have to deal with a lot of things. Um, and so I'd like to think that I'm a brave person or a courageous person, but I was still stuck on her question about why wouldn't you just, even in the fear of when you were in the courthouse, like it's so easy to just say, oh, I'm here from traffic court, you know? <laughs> and so I'm just curious, I mean, I'm just curious if you think, um, if you were not have to, to put it on the hearts of clergymen and women specifically to come out, do you, do you think it would have at all influenced you to not have heard him say the word clergyman? It's a very good question, and I thank you, and I've never been asked that before. Um, so I'll try an answer that uh, I may change tomorrow morning. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know whether I would have. I went through Harvard not knowing whether I wanted to be a minister or not. I had a Rockefeller Brothers Fellowship to go to pay my first year at Harvard. To be eligible for that uh, fellowship, I had to be uncertain I wanted to go into the ministry. So I was eminently qualified <laughs> for that. But I went through the f three, then four years, and came out the other side, and glad that I, and then went into a church. I was minister of church, and I, I was glad I w went, and glad I went into the ministry. But I also, for, I stopped being a parish minister in 1978, longer than, than most of you live. <laughs> uh, and I've done corporate consulting work, uh, but I've also continued strong contact with my own denomination. Um, I, 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 I don't know whether I would. I, now, if I were not, well, I'm not formally in the, well, I am still a minister, but if, if there were to be a similar occasion now, I think I would go. I think I would go. Anna would probably say, no, 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 not again, please. We don't need any more talks about that. <laughs> um, but I think I would go. I, I went to the, the William Barber's uh, uh, r r thing in Raleigh, uh, the forward to Moral Monday. Uh, he's a leader in, in uh, South Carolina, North Carolina. Uh, Big, he was head of the N NAACP in North Carolina, and now he's another organization. But he is a, he's, if there's any Martin Luther King on the horizon, there's William Barber. Um, so a name you could pay attention to. Um, and I, w I went to that. I went to Raleigh, which is a five hours, let's say, from our home. And I was glad I went. Uh, I, 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 I I, it would ha it's hard for me to answer the question. It's hard for me to answer the question. I hope that I would. I hope that I would. But I might have the excuse that uh, uh, my doctor said don't travel too much. <laughs> uh, one last thing uh, related to what Moriyama brought up about the present time. You know, you mentioned the... Um, seeing that billboard of King, you know, King is a communist, you know, and throughout the movement, um, you know, they constantly used labels like that and code words, you know, to try to get people, you know, um, to oppose, you know, whatever, to oppose the movement and so forth. Um, you know, somebody's a communist um, or it's, it's all because the Jews, the Jews are controlling everything um, or, um, you know, other, you know, or homosexuals. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, it's, uh, they discredit people by grouping them and so forth. And, you know, to me, you know, during the campaign in 2016, I mean, it just seemed like, you know, we'd rediscovered the, you know, the power of, you know, classifying people as other, you know, and using that politically and so forth. So, you know, the, your advice to us at the museum, you know, because even saying that is, you know, kind of politically fraught now. The Holocaust Museum, so many of their programs are really about that. And they've, they've said, you know, 
it's not just about the Holocaust, and it's not just about Jews, but it's really about this idea of, yeah. you know, labeling people and getting and get, getting people into camps so that they'll do, you know, the way you get people to do awful things to each other is to think of the other group as not the same as you. Um, are you seeing, you know, how, how do you think one combats that? And how do you, and, you know, what advice do you have for us at the museum to try to, you know, express that, that that is a, a challenge for making a better country in the future? I think I just have to start talking. Um, I think there's always an opportunity for, to, first of all, to treat the other the person that you're talking to as a whole person, and if they come up with some kind of statement that's offensive to you, uh, to raise a question about that. Would you say the same thing about um, the neighbor from Honduras who's living next to you, or you know, the, whatever the whatever the other might be in their lives? Would you say the same thing about them? And um, referring to racial things, is, do we look the same beneath the skin? Um, aren't we all the same? And um, if you see the Henry Louis Gates um, Roots program, uh, the DNA and tracing. Uh, um, last night, we were, Anna and I were watching one where two or three Af Af African-American, there was an African-American woman whose, whose ancestors had slaves, owned slaves. And uh, that doesn't fit the usual script, um, but that's part of our lives. Um, we've all got some stuff in, my, in, their, in our past, and we've all got some stuff in our present that we're not so happy about. Um, so what do you do with that? Uh, I just think if you can engage people in some kind of conversation about how would you, how, how are, you, are you treating this other person by a label or are you treating another person as a, as a whole person? I was in, Anna and I were both in South Africa years ago during apartheid. And it was a terrible time to be in South Africa. I mean, it, the apartheid conditions. And I was there doing research on the possibility of creating uh, training programs for blacks to be supervisors. And I met a, I met a man on this, uh, a white man carrying a briefcase on the street in Johannesburg and asked him, how do I get from here to where I'm staying? We got into a conversation and he turned out he was the executive director of the, of the, uh, uh, African, the, the ruling party of, of South Africa at that time, which was, of course, ruled by the Afrikaans nationality, the whites who were, who were in favor of apartheid. And uh, I told him what I was about. And he said, oh, that's great. I said, uh, he said, you need to talk, uh, that I was there to do research on possibility of training blacks to be supervisors. He said, you need to talk with so-and-so who's in Pretoria, and I'll arrange it for you. He's in charge of training for the South African government. So the next day, I was there uh, in talking with him. But meanwhile, I said to this guy, what do you think, uh, how, how do you think Africans would, South Af I'm sorry, blacks would think about such and such? And he said, he's an anthropology professor. He said to me, I don't know, I've never had a conversation with an African, with an African. Never had a conversation. I'm sure he didn't mean he'd never given an order to a maid or you know, to a whatever. But he'd never had a conversation with an African. I said, oh my God, how could you be in this position as an anthropology professor? The next day, by the way, I was in the office of this head of training for the South African government. I told him what I was about to develop. Our company, our American company, was such, 
to a subsidiary in, in, in an office in South Africa, Johannesburg, was, was planning on or hoping to do some training for supervisors. And I said, our company, in creating a training program, we create the video pieces that shows the work situation, how to behave and how not to behave in, you know, in these videos. I said, can we show black supervising whites? And he gulped. <laughs> he said, well, I guess you'll have to show some. And I said, can we show women supervising men? He said, oh, no. No, I can't do that. I can't do that. That was interesting, huh? The stuff we carry around with us. Yeah. Well, uh, we want to thank you so much for being with us today and sharing this. Thank you all for coming.